Research and development is the backbone of innovation in the U.S. In today's interview, we spoke with the leader of the largest independent nonprofit R&D organization in the world. Lou Von Thayer is the president and CEO of Battelle, and he's a seven-time WASH 100 award winner. We spoke with Lou to get a better understanding of the R&D landscape in the public sector and where we can expect to see meaningful tech growth in the future. If you enjoyed today's interview, please like, share, subscribe, and turn on notifications. Also, we would love to hear from you. If you have a question for the leaders of GovCon, please drop a comment below or email studio at executivemosaic.com. Hello, and welcome to Executive Mosaic's video interview series. I'm Summer Myatt, and here to speak with me today is Lou Von Thayer, President and CEO of Battelle. Lou, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Summer. So, Lou, can you talk about the current state of the research and development landscape in the federal government? What are some of the high priority areas you're currently seeing? Yeah, you know, I think it's we're actually in a good place today. Uh, after a drumbeat of the last 15 years, to as we watch China rise and some of their behaviors uh, maybe go in directions that we would have preferred to go other ways, uh, I think we're finally in a position in the last four or five years, starting with the last administration into this one, where we have alignment between uh, the Senate, the uh, funding agencies, and the White House. And I think that's put us in a good place. Uh, the budgets are strong today. I think we all have to keep an eye on the deficit and what happens. Everyone always says when... Um, when uh, they're going to cut, if, if we have to do that later, then we won't cut R&D. But in practicality, so much of the money is already obligated, either among personnel or among systems that are in multi-year buys, that R&D always gets cut. But today, things look pretty good. For us, you know, we see a few areas that we're really interested in and, and very focused on. Um, I break it down into what I would say kind of countering um, threats to the supply access of things, like uranium, rare earth elements, even microelectronics, things we might not be able to get that are key to how we build our systems. Um, countering gaps in altitude, uh, spectrum use, cybersecurity. Uh, we've watched um, our competitors, especially China, uh, as they built their military up to do it in the places where our gaps, you know, where maybe we have little gaps in how we operate and they've been smart around that and we need to, to look and we see opportunities to, to be able to go back and defend in those areas. And then things that extend operator reach and, uh, and decision making, particularly artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning, some of those areas. And then one last area I'll mention, which has less to do with uh, peer competitors, but it's just a, a focus of this administration and something that's very important is this whole environmental cleanup, uh, carbon management and things like that. And we're playing a large role in there. We'll probably talk a little bit more about that as we go through the interview. Lou, you mentioned increasing global competition, and I want to dig into that a little bit more. I'm curious, which emerging technologies do you anticipate will have the greatest impact on our standing in the global power competition in the next few years? And where are you seeing those possibilities for accelerated tech growth? It's those areas we talked about, right? Areas can give a little bit longer standoff. Um, areas that can assure we have supply access, think microelectronics, microelectronics assurance. Um, how can you tell that uh, an integrated circuit with a billion chips on it, a billion transistors on it, is actually doing what it's supposed to and developing uh, modern methods to be able to do those kind of things? Uh, those are places where I think there's, we know there's agreement in, in technologies we're going to need and how we're going to operate. We spent the last you know, since 9-11, we've um, really been fighting in areas where we controlled the air, we could get up close and personal and do low-flying low aircraft, things like that. Uh, that never worked in a peer competition, and it won't in a, the coming peer competition. So we're swinging back to kind of the modern version of what I would, I would say the old Cold War days from where I started my career. Lou, I want to ask you more about R&D. How do you aim to evolve the R&D model to drive accelerated innovation, especially in light of the increasing competition we've been talking about? Well, that's a great question. And, you know, I started my career at Bell Laboratories. It's probably the biggest focus we've had since I've gotten to Battelle. And um, we spend much of our time looking at that R&D model and how we work it because we compete by discrimination. We try to do it on every contract. Uh, we're, you know, we compete in this marketplace where our cost structure is probably a little bit higher than others. So I've got a 
headquarters building I'm sitting in, it's a million and a half square feet and has 50 laboratories with PhDs running in it. Most of our competitors don't carry those kind of expenses. So we've really focused. And what we've looked at is we've started with what are the most challenging problems, uh, areas, um, and then what can we do about them? I mean, everything from plastics recycling to uh, microelectronics assurance we mentioned a minute ago uh, to environmental uh, cleanup of areas. And, and then we get our teams together and we actually put together a tech council of our best researchers. And they actually look at this and they'll kick off um, ideas from the business and start low level investments in R&D. And then as some of these start to gain traction, we actually have a sales team that goes out and assesses markets, make sure there's really a market there. And, and the things we ultimately, as we invest more, become relevant to be able to make a difference in the marketplace and solve some of these problems. This has really worked well for us over the last five years. It's led to several spinouts. It's um, helped us really um, increase our game and grow the business pretty dramatically. Uh, and when we get done, there's kind of three options we use to what we do with these technologies that are developed from the R&D scheme. You know, one is we keep them and use them in our core offerings to our defense customers. You know, two is we can spin out a company if we think there's a commercial avenue that um, a new CEO and, and, and outside funding to accelerate and get to the market quicker. And then three, we will be licensed to a major player sometimes. And, and all those metrics have been uh, rising rapidly the last five years. I'd like to ask you more about that. Um, can you tell me about Battelle's growth strategy for 2023? I know you mentioned Battelle's core focus areas. Where are you seeing opportunities for expansion in Battelle's portfolio and what new markets or capabilities are you looking to tap into? You know, we, um, we've been pretty lucky the last five years since we've put this focus on the R&D. We've worked a lot on our culture. Uh, we've had a, a team that's been very courageous and worked very hard to step up. And as a team, we've been able to go from $5 billion a year uh, in revenues to over eleven this last year, all organically without M&A. And it's, it's been the result of the work that team's done. And when I look at where we're going today, um, environmental cleanups, one of the areas I mentioned earlier, we're seeing big markets come in and we've invented some technologies that are relevant that no one else has at this point to do things like uh, these forever chemicals that you hear of these uh, per and polyfluoroalkali uh, substances. They're really a bad thing. Um, turns out Patel's been working for the EPA for 20 some years and measuring these, uh, looking at how they've moved around groundwater, where they've gotten in our environment. And as they started teaching me about this, the electrical engineer that didn't know too much about it, um, you know, my first impression was, oh, geez, this is worse than asbestos. Because um, not only is it something we have to get rid of, but uh, it, it's a very small molecule. So it's getting into groundwater. And it's also a very strong molecule. It's the strongest um, bond in nature. So that's why it works so well. And things like waterproofing on our clothes, uh, Teflon coatings, uh, fire retardant foam, it works so well because these bonds are very strong. So we've actually come up with the technology and we just uh, broke out a new company to go do it with contracts to start addressing this in the marketplace uh, that can actually destroy this chemical and break it down and turn it into its native components to where uh, uh, we can actually take it out of the environment where most of the, the uh, techniques today simply filter it and move it somewhere else or they incinerate it and just put it in the air and we breathe it later on. So there's a handful of areas like that in the environment and um, market electronics assurance I've mentioned in some of our classified areas. We see a good market need and um, we've come up with relevant technologies over the previous years and are aggressively working to expand uh, and build those places out. Lou, I know Battelle has focused on creating intellectual property or IP over the last few years. Can you elaborate on the importance behind this effort and how it plays into your growth strategy? Yeah, well, it ties very um, closely to the last question that you asked about our strategy. If you're going to cost a little bit more because you have a bunch of very smart PhDs and others running around, uh, and you come up with these great ideas, you better have a way to protect them and, and be able to get them to the market and actually be able to get the earnings and the benefit from that uh, for a time. So we've really focused on that. We use that tech council to screen and um, we've been able to take uh, we, we've been able to take our IP generation, the, both the ideas we call an IPDR is kind of the first idea an engineer or a scientist has that they document. Um, all the way through patents filed and um, received patents by about four times uh, of what it used to be on a run rate over the last years. And we're creating a very robust IP portfolio. And that's what we're leveraging in these marketplaces. It's what we use as we uh, take these things to market. And 
the goal is we want every bid we go after that's of any size to have some technical differentiation. Otherwise, we probably shouldn't be messing with it. If we're just trying to beat somebody else on how much an engineer costs per hour, we're probably not going to do very well. I want to talk about the workforce. The U.S. currently doesn't have enough STEM graduates to meet the demand of STEM jobs. I'm curious how your work at Battelle aims to change that narrative and bolster the country's STEM talent pipeline. Yeah, well, first off, you're exactly right. Uh, if I look across our portfolio today, including the national laboratories we manage, we are probably 3,500 to 4,000 engineers and scientists short uh, that we have job openings for today. And we're all interviewing and, and hiring like crazy as best we can. Um, maybe the economy as, as it weakens will lighten that load a little bit, but I do think we have a fundamental problem in this country that um, we're just not educating kids in these STEM subjects fast enough at the high enough volume. Uh, we're leaving too many of our inner city uh, uh, school systems out and too many of the, those demographics that um, you know we have talent being left behind. So Battelle's a nonprofit, first one I've ever worked for. We operate very much like a for-profit company, but instead of paying dividends, we actually give back to our communities. We use that money. And last year, that money was uh, $27 million, a new high. And we use a lot of it to actually build out STEM programs to help administrations and teachers uh, get STEM into classrooms. And we set a goal uh, five years ago that we wanted to impact a million kids a year. At that time, we were impacting about 100,000 kids a year, uh, largely here in the Midwest. Uh, this last year, our team knocked it out of the park, and we uh, met that goal for the first time and actually impacted 1.4 million students um, in STEM. So we're trying to create the next generation. We also run a, a, a middle school, high school here called the Metro School of um, Early College. And um, out of that, we've gotten kids from a random draw uh, for 16 years out of school systems that are really struggling, and everyone's graduated. And um, that model's worked so well, we just raised $30 million and are breaking ground now to build a new school that'll open up the end of, of 24, so to be, to be able to expand. Once these kids get out of high school, that's mostly for uh, K through 12. Once they get out of high school, we have a very extensive internship programs and co-op programs. And, and of course, we want to introduce them not only to STEM, where they can have a great career and, and impact their own lives and control their own destiny rather than others deciding that for them. But hopefully a lot of them will come to work here. We'll fill those gaps that we have. <laughs> <laughs> well, Lou, congratulations. That's really important work. Lastly, how has GovCon changed since you began your career, and what's your take on the market now? Boy, that's a loaded question. Uh, so not to date myself, but this is my 40th year doing this, and um, it's, a, it's very different. You know, I started out, I mentioned at Bell Laboratories, and uh, we were working on the uh, first fiber optic uh, surveillance system for undersea. Uh, it was uh, the SOSA system. And um, back in those days, uh, Projects were very long, very slow. Usually, you would develop. We developed custom IC technologies at Bell Labs to build these because commercial couldn't do it in those days. And projects went on for five, ten years. Um, when I became a little bit more senior in my career and was running a division of General Dynamics, so we had people that would retire out of our Pittsfield, Massachusetts office who had been working on the Trident missile program and spent forty some years on the same program. Uh, I think the industry has really evolved, um, starting with when the cold when the wall fell from the Cold War uh, several decades ago and built out. I think we're much more nimble today. We move much faster. We've cut our cost bases almost by half, I think, from overhead percentages of what they used to be when I started. Uh, and I think it's made a real difference um, for the country. You know, we're never quite as nimble as we'd like to be. Uh, at the same time, when you look at all the requirements to protect the taxpayer dollars of all the auditors that live with us and the the you know people that are signing off on everything that we do, you know those things naturally slow a business down some. But the business has really come a long way, and I look at it how nimble we can be as contractors and what we produce today on uh, same dollar averages from what we used to. And this industry has come a long way, and I think it's uh, it's patriots and contractors that work in it should be applauded. And, and for me personally, um, you know, I've spent uh, 40 years doing this. I love it. I still have a ways to go. But um, for me, it's it, the one thing that's been consistent this whole time is in this industry, we always get to do work that's exciting, that's important. And um, I think you get to work with people that are very honorable. And that's, that's what's kept me here this time, despite offers to maybe go do other things over the years. Well, Lou, thank you so much for your time today and for all the work you do at Battelle. Well, thank you so much.